Beckman. I'm leading the development teams at Tendermint and Cosmos. Um, we are building a lot of things, actually. Uh, so there's a lot of actual software products within that large scope of Tendermint and Cosmos. Um, the most popular is probably Tendermint itself, which is a general purpose Byzantine fault tolerant state machine replication engine. So obviously everyone understands exactly what that means. Um, but basically that is a, the, the best way I know to pack into one small phrase the idea of being able to take uh, an arbitrary application written to run on one computer and uh, replicating it across many computers, keeping them all in sync in such a way that if, even if some of those computers fail or behave adversarially, uh, everything still works. So that's what Tendermint does. Um, we're building a number of things uh, within Cosmos as well. Um, there is our, our Merkle tree, which is a very advanced form of um, kind of like the Ethereum state tree, um, but it has a lot more features and is more efficient and, and packs a nice punch. Um, we are building a, uh, a framework that we call the Cosmos SDK, which is a kind of a, a general framework for building cryptocurrency-like applications wi within the Go programming language um, on top of Tendermint. And we're also building a inter-blockchain communication primitive that we call IBC that takes advantage of certain properties of the Tendermint consensus to allow for uh, cheap and efficient and fast communication between blockchains. Very cool. So, so that makes sense. So. Do you want to talk a little bit about some of the kind of specific problems that you're trying to solve with maybe with Cosmos? Sure. So, well, I'll back up a minute just, just yeah. to talk about Tendermint for a second. The, the specific thing we were trying to solve there, I mean, where we kind of started was, um, you know, Tendermint was initially this like proof of stake cryptocurrency. And then, you know, I got involved and I was like, um, I was working for Monax Industries at the time and they were really involved in the Ethereum space. Like we want a, an Ethereum uh, an Ethereum-based proof-of-stake, right? Or a proof-of-stake-based Ethereum, right? And they were like, oh, we have Go Ethereum and we have Tendermint, right? Maybe there's some way we can start to combine them. And so, and so working with Jay Kwan on Tendermint, we ended up re-implementing the Ethereum virtual machine on top of Tendermint. Um, and then and so it was all kind of bundled in, right? And then over time, we realized, you know what? Maybe this isn't quite the best approach. Like all of these blockchain stacks, they're so monolithic, right? It's really hard to actually use the various components of them to build a, a slightly different thing, right? And so that, that led to the idea of, hey, why don't we try to find this nice separation between the, the consensus element and all the application stuff? Right? And we did that, and we call that the ABCI, the Application Blockchain Interface. And that's what makes Tendermint so general purpose now is because you can build applications in any programming language you want, uh, whether it's Go or Python or C or Java or JavaScript or Erlang or Haskell, whatever, right? You run them in one process, you run Tendermint in another process, and Tendermint takes care of all the peer-to-peer -peer stuff, all the consensus stuff and everything, and your application deals with all the application logic, the transaction mechanics, and so on. And so this, this was a, a really kind of powerful breakthrough in the actual world of, um, say, practical use of blockchain software, consensus software, that now you had a real robust uh, software system, consensus system, that could be used with many, many application states without kind of the overhead that comes when you're using a monolithic stack. Right. So now it's possible to take the Go Ethereum code base, run that on top of Tendermint, or to take the Parity code base, run that on top of Tendermint, or to take you know the Tezos code base and run that on top of Tendermint, right? So you can get uh, a wide diversity of application states and run them on top of the consensus algorithm, right? But, you know, so that's, that's solving one problem of kind of the flexibility in the, in the development of blockchain applications, right? Because short of doing that, you're pretty much confined to writing smart contracts and solidity on top of Ethereum. And you know, as much as I love Ethereum, the honest truth is no one really wants to be doing that, right? So, so okay, so it solves that problem. But then it, it kind of creates another problem, which is a problem that already sort of exists, which is, well, you have all these blockchains, they have all these different application states, now what, right? Now they're all kind of uh, self-sovereign and independent from one another. How, if at all, are they going to interoperate or communicate, right, or, or coordinate even? And so, and so now you get to this problem of trying to think, okay, you have, um, you know, you're, you've enabled arbitrary state machines to run on top of your consensus engine. Now you have many of those, many different state machines running in the wild. How are you now going to enable those different state machines, each of them running on a distributed fault tolerant network, to understand each other and to talk to each other? And so this was kind of the the driving mission behind Cosmos was to build. Uh, a new set of standards or a new set of protocols that would allow the existing and the new applications that, that people are building to start to understand each other and to interoperate. And so, so Cosmos, at least currently specifically, uses some of the properties of the Tendermint consensus that make it very efficient for light client proofs to enable widely diverse application states or application uh, state machines to understand each other so long as they've all implemented that common set 
of the tendermint light client, right? And that's what we call the IBC, the Inner Blockchain Communication Protocol. So that's really kind of the goal and what we're working towards with Cosmos. And, and so not only will that allow um, different kinds of application states to talk to one another, it also allows you to do things like first order scalability for something like Ethereum, because then you could have many independent uh, tenement blockchains, each running the Ethereum virtual machine, each with a different state, with different contracts deployed and so on, so that you can get the kind of isolation and scalability that comes from sharding and still have the cross-chain communication, but in a way that you have a, a lot more flexibility on how each of those chains can actually be run, right? And that's sort of where we, where we start to differ from some of the sharding proposals. Okay, so that's really, so I, I, may, maybe you kind of implied the answer to this, but so, so over the last kind of year or two, we've seen this like massive proliferation in the number of blockchains. You know, at, like at one point there was just Bitcoin and now there's you know, tens or hundreds of different blockchains. Do you see that um, proliferation kind of continuing or do you, see the, do you think there'll be some kind of consolidation? Yeah, I, I see the proliferation continuing because I think we're just sort of at the beginning of experimenting with this. And so I don't really like, I don't think about Cosmos as a single blockchain because it's not. We happen, you know, the, there will be, there's a blockchain we're putting up hopefully this summer um, that's called the Cosmos Hub and that's kind of the first blockchain within the Cosmos network. But the goal for Cosmos is to really promote and nurture and provide an environment for experimentation with many, many different kinds of blockchains because the truth is we still don't know everything we need to know about consensus. We don't even know what the limits are of what we don't know, right? right. We still don't know much about how to design secure virtual machines, right? Uh, how to make them efficient on modern hardware. Maybe there's future hardware that's coming that we want to target them to. We don't really, we're still struggling to, to better understand how to build um, languages that, that have the safety properties and that can provide the kind of guarantees we want when we're writing you know, highly critical software like smart contracts handling millions of dollars. We still don't know the extent to which certain of the cryptographic primitives we're using are actually secure or whether the assumptions hold up or you know, how advanced we can get with certain kinds of proofs and whatever. So the goal with Cosmos is to provide an environment in which we can really do the experimentation in all these different realms, whether it's the consensus, the virtual machines, the cryptography itself, certain uh, game theoretic aspects, the governance components, all of this we want people to experiment with uh, within the Cosmos Network. And the reason you can do it within the Cosmos Network is because when you launch one of these blockchains, it won't be completely independent and unable to talk to the others. It will come with mechanisms that will enable it to more easily interoperate. That's at least the goal. Okay, that makes sense. So, so to change tack slightly, um, how did you kind of first get into the blockchain space? What was your kind of first involvement in, in blockchain technology? Well, um, my background's in biophysics and I study kind of emergent complexity and how life is possible in a universe that's always running down, so to speak. Um, and that, that's what I was fascinated by. Uh, and, and it's kind of the same, same problem of like state machines, distributed state, but operating in a biophysical medium, you might say, right? Each, you know, your cell kind of contains this distributed state that acts on inputs from the outside world, has to maintain some kind of consistency and coordination with other cells, right? And, out, and it outputs something. And it's very fault tolerant, right? You can kill a bunch of cells and your body still, still works and heals and all this, right? So it's an it's a amazing model to use. But, then I discovered Bitcoin in early 2013. I didn't quite understand it at first, but once I started digging, I realized very quickly that, that this was the same phenomenon happening in the digital medium that I was studying in the biophysical medium. And, and that was it for me, I went all in. So you know, uh, I bought my first Bitcoins, I guess, sometime in that year around when the, when the Cyprus crisis happens. And at the time I was just trying to figure out how to be part of this thing and okay. how to use the, this internet money. And it was kind of floored that I had to actually find someone in person to buy it off of because the exchanges didn't work back then. Yeah. Um, you know, and then I sold a bunch of them and, and whatever. But uh, I started I started trying to learn much more, I guess, that summer over the course of the next year about um, the cryptographic kind of subcomponents and how elliptic curves work and Merkle trees and just like catching up on distributed systems, which I didn't really have the, the background in because I hadn't really studied it. And this was showing me, you know, you really need to start studying this stuff. And so I did and I ended up doing a master's in computer science so that I could actually catch up, yeah. Very interesting. Um, so are there any kind of, so maybe outside of, so I know that Cosmos, I think you're planning on going live relatively soon. Uh, so, so maybe outside of the kind of Cosmos and Tendermint world, are there any other kind of uh, projects that you're particularly excited about that you're that kind of coming down the line in the nearest future? Yeah, um, there's a lot. I'm excited about, um, I'm excited about a lot of what's happening in the, honestly, within the Ethereum kind of research community. I think they're doing interesting stuff with sharding. Um, I'm excited about a lot of the new state channel research coming out of L4. Right. Um, that stuff's really cool. Um, I also like the way they've really refused to do uh, an ICO um, and just kind of figure out how to fund themselves yeah. with grants. 
but but I'm excited about that work. I'm excited about the sharding. I'm excited about uh, some of the other um, scalability proposals. Um, like Definity is doing some interesting stuff with uh, the verifiable randomness. I think that's cool. Um, uh, I, I don't know what you know their their scope might be increasing a little bit, but um, they're, I know they're also working on a, a virtual machine. Uh, you know, Tezos is obviously working on a virtual machine, so I think that's cool yeah. as well. So I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in these, um, in the scalability solutions and in the new virtual machine designs that try to provide better uh, features and guarantees for um, programs. Very cool. Um, so, you, so obviously, so this kind of business of polymath is helping companies uh, issue Kind of regulatory compliant security tokens at the moment on the Ethereum blockchain. Do you kind of do you or Cosmos have a kind of view around where you see like tokenization of assets in general going? You know, maybe as it relates to like you know, having that working across multiple blockchains uh, or you know, through the kind of Cosmos hub and across multiple blockchains. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, certainly it's it's. Uh it's some, it seems like something of an inevitability that, that, that a huge number of assets, both physical and digital, will come to be uh, tokenized, so to speak, yeah. and, to, and to be uh, maintained and operated on these distributed um, networks. Um, I don't know. Um, personally, I still happen to think that the killer app of the blockchain is currency. And, and this is kind of a controversial statement. Everyone's looking for you know, the next, the, the big killer app, whatever. And, and it's like, no, it's already here, guys. Um, it's not ICOs, it's not supply chain, it's not all these things. As much as the blockchain might be useful in all these things and in you know, the provenance of them and so on, I think currency is really gonna be, is really the killer app because I, I see that uh, the, the currencies we use today are too abstracted away from the actual concerns of real people on the ground to adequately price um, the values of communities, right? And so I'm, I'm interested in a world where uh, communities are able to operate using their own kind of local currencies that are more reflective of their own values, that are issued for behaviors that that community finds valuable, and to kind of build up global commerce on top of that. Exactly how that relates to the, to the tokenization of securities I don't quite know, but I but it but it does seem to be closely related, especially insofar as uh, insofar as we want to tokenize, say, not a physical asset directly, at least me, but more the productive capacity to create something, right? So, for instance, um, you know whether whether it's the ability to, to to produce food or to distribute food or to to educate children or to produce some kind of you know creative outwork, whatever it might be, right? So these are the kinds of things I'm really interested in trying to figure out how to how to tokenize so that we can more directly reward people engaging in behavior that has traditionally been left out or undervalued by the global financial system. Thank you very much. I don't know if I answered your question. But. Well no it was, it was definitely an answer to the question, yeah. Uh -huh. um, so, so that's really great. Are there any kind of common misconceptions about Cosmos and Tendermint that you come across that, that you want to kind of take an opportunity to clear up? Um, sure, sure. I could, I, could, I could touch on a couple. I guess one is uh, Tendermint doesn't have a coin. Tendermint is okay. general purpose software. Um, it's very powerful software for, again, replicating arbitrary state machines. And that can be any kind of state machine. It can be written in any programming language. Um, that means you can run Ethereum as is on top of Tendermint. You can run any other blockchain application as is more or less uh, on top of Tendermint. So um, that's one thing with respect to Tendermint. And of course, you know, some people claim that it's vaporware or that it can't work or anything like this. And, and that's all ridiculous. Consensus algorithms have been working um, for decades now. Uh, every major internet company uses one at the bottom of its stack. Tendermint is very, very similar to the kinds of things people are already using, whether it's Google or Amazon or Kubernetes or whatever, at the bottom of those stacks, there is a consensus algorithm, a consensus engine. What makes Tendermint unique is that it can tolerate uh, uh, a more diverse set of failures, shall we say. Um, so those traditional algorithms can only tolerate crashes, net th processes go down, machines go down, networks fail, whatever. Tendermint can tolerate those and more. It can tolerate more arbitrary behavior and even explicitly malicious behavior. And that's what makes it so powerful and potentially a replacement for um, those kinds of systems that are already running today. But Cosmos is then something separate from Tendermint that is being built on top of Tendermint that is leveraging many of the properties of Tendermint to build a wider um, network of interoperable blockchains. And, and the way I think of Cosmos is more about the underlying tools and primitives and standards we're developing than any particular blockchain we're putting up. Because the honest truth is this is all a big experiment, right? It's a massive experiment. We don't know how it's gonna shake out and it's very possible that we'll get it all wrong. And, and we're certainly doing our best to not, obviously. Um, but, 
you know, we don't know how it's going to shape out. There's, there's new kinds of economics. It's a new kind of network that has never really uh, been put up before in terms of validators that have to be online with private keys that are online and that have stake uh, associated with them that become prime targets for hacking and destruction and, and whatever. So um, it's a grand experiment and obviously I'm, I'm certainly hoping it succeeds and that it builds new kinds of business models and new kinds of values in the world. But ultimately what, what I'm really in it for is the general purpose software and modules and standards and primitives that can be recomposed by other people in ways that we didn't think of or that are different than what we did to build the kind of digital network that works for them, right? And so I'm, I'm mostly interested in, in this kind of general purpose software that can be used by communities and used by groups of people to achieve their own goals separate from we, what we might have thought they needed. Because I, the only thing I don't know is that uh, I don't know. Sorry, the only thing I know is that I don't know. Okay. There you go. Cool. Uh, and then uh, lastly, where can people go, you know, what links, or where can people go to find out more about Tendermint you know, and or Cosmos? Sure. So we have websites and GitHubs for both. So Tendermint.com is the Tendermint website, and GitHub.com slash Tendermint is where you can find our repositories. Of course, everything's open source and always has been. Um, and for Cosmos, it's Cosmos.network, okay. and you can find it on GitHub.com slash Cosmos. Perfect. Thank you very much uh, for joining us here. Today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.